Hello, my name is Jeremy, and this is the True Crime Chronicles channel. What are the odds that the individual who recently walked past is in fact a habitual offender? And suppose, unwittingly, he is a wrongdoer, and you choose to engage with him, maybe inquire about the time or remark on the pleasantness of today's weather. In this scenario, do you believe your chances of survival are significant? What's your opinion? In 2016, the city of Anchorage, Alaska, was terrorized by a serial criminal. In just a few months, this villain took the lives of a total of five people. At first glance, there seemed to be nothing connecting the victims, nor were there any similarities between them. This fact only added to the residents' fear, making it seem as if everyone could potentially be in danger and easily become the next victim of a brutal attack by an unknown assailant. The police did everything in their power to determine who was responsible for these crimes. However, they were unable to find any concrete evidence, as all leads turned up nothing. This was the case until an event, completely unrelated to the horrific incidents, led officers directly to the criminal. To fully dive into today's story, let's go back about seven years to the summer of 2016. Anchorage, the most populous city in Alaska, which acts as its de facto capital, houses roughly 300,000 residents. The narrative commenced on July 3, 2016, at 7.40 a.m., when a distress signal was sent to 911 by a woman on a bicycle ride. She disclosed that she had encountered two individuals deceased in the grass beside a path known as Ship Creek. From their attire, they appeared to be a young male and female, presumably dead due to the significant injuries on their skulls and the extensive blood pooled beneath them. The biker quickly deduced that a tragic event had befallen these individuals and swiftly contacted the emergency services. Regrettably, her suspicions were confirmed. Upon arrival, neither the emergency medical teams nor the police could alter the outcome. The victims were beyond help. They were assessed to have died shortly before their discovery, given their bodies retained warmth. Evidently, their demise was unnatural, resulting from violent assaults. Autopsies revealed the cause of death as gunshot wounds to the chest and head. The identities of the deceased, carrying their IDs, were soon confirmed by law enforcement to be 41-year-old Jason Netter and 20-year-old Brianna Foisy. Born in 1996 into a challenging family environment, Brianna and her older sister were soon placed in a shelter. Their luck changed when Marcella Foisy noticed them, choosing to offer the girls a nurturing and supportive home among other children. At five years old, Brianna was welcomed into a foster family. Early on, she was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome, a result of prenatal alcohol exposure. Additionally, Brianna showed signs of attachment disorder, a condition characterized by a lack of emotional bond with caregivers, leading to trust issues, adaptation challenges, and difficulties in social interactions. This was further compounded by a learning disability diagnosis. Despite these hurdles, she was known as an energetic and outgoing young lady with a passion for music, particularly Broadway shows, and a talent for singing, often sharing her performances in short video clips. Yet, underneath her positive exterior and love for life, Brianna faced several struggles. Her adoptive mother, Marcella, revealed that Brianna's developmental issues hindered her ability to make wise choices, particularly regarding people and situations. This resulted in questionable friendships during her teenage years and an eventual drift into a problematic circle, culminating in a substance abuse issue with psychoactive drugs. Marcella attempted to guide her towards seeking assistance and rehabilitation, but after turning 18, Brianna was free to make her own choices, even those against her well-being. Choosing independence due to her reluctance to abide by household rules, she faced homelessness, lacking the financial means for housing. Despite these circumstances, she managed to stay in touch and maintain a close relationship with her mother, finding temporary refuge in homeless shelters. Jason Netter, the other individual who fell victim to the tragic incident, likewise lacked a stable living situation. Known for his kindness, humor, sociability, and willingness to assist others, he had a deep affection for nature and animals. Yet, akin to Brianna, Jason struggled with the misuse of psychoactive substances, which resulted in multiple legal issues. His unemployment further complicated his life, rendering him unable to provide child support for his two daughters. During the summer of 2016, he found temporary shelter in an Anchorage landfill, situated near the Ship Creek bike trail, where both he and Brianna would ultimately be discovered deceased. Despite their age disparity, 
Jason and Brianna formed a strong bond of friendship. Having experienced homelessness for an extended period, Netter became a protective figure for Brianna, particularly given her youthfulness. He endeavored to shield her from various dangers, a task at which, tragically, he did not succeed, as evidenced by their untimely deaths by gunshot on the trail's edge. Upon their arrival, the initial action taken by the police was to scrutinize the victims and the scene of the crime closely. They quickly observed the absence of shell casings near the deceased, leading them to deduce that the murderer might have employed a revolver, a firearm known for retaining its casings within the cylinder upon discharge. Additionally, a solitary bullet was discovered in proximity to where Jason and Brianna lay, indicating that the shooter had aimed at the pair, but missed, with the projectile instead striking a wooden fence nearby. This bullet was seized as tangible evidence and forwarded for forensic examination. Subsequent analysis by specialists corroborated the hypothesis regarding the use of a revolver and even pinpointed the specific model of the firearm. It was identified as a Colt Python 357, a six-shot revolver renowned for its exceptional trigger sensitivity and accuracy, marking it as a premier choice within its category. This particular model is relatively rare. While delving deeper into the investigation beyond the crime scene, detectives chose to interview the witness who had alerted the emergency services about the grim discovery. Her account added an eerie twist to the case. Her encounter with Brianna and Jason's bodies wasn't mere happenstance, but guided by an enigmatic stranger. She detailed to the authorities that on her morning bike ride across a bridge, a man nonchalantly informed her of the presence of two deceased individuals on the trail below cautioning her to be mindful of her surroundings before continuing on his way. Motivated by the stranger's cryptic directions, she ventured down to the trail, where she stumbled upon the young victims and subsequently contacted emergency responders. The detectives were particularly intrigued by this unknown man. His behavior raised several red flags, his failure to report the bodies himself, his lack of urgency or distress over the discovery, and his eerily calm demeanor as if he were cautioning against a minor inconvenience, rather than a fatal tragedy. This odd encounter led the police to speculate that he might be connected to the murders of the two individuals experiencing homelessness. Regrettably, the witness was unable to offer a detailed description of the man, having focused more on the horrifying scene before her than on the person who directed her to it. She couldn't recall any specific features, attire, or identifying characteristics of the man. In pursuit of leads, the investigation team turned their attention to nearby surveillance footage, hoping that the mysterious individual might have been captured on camera. Although the trail itself lacked surveillance, cameras in the adjacent industrial area facing towards Ship Creek provided a potential source of evidence. Reviewing the footage from around the time of the emergency call, they spotted a man traversing the trail shortly before the discovery was reported. However, his direction of travel away from the camera obscured any chance of identifying his face. The footage only offered a vague impression of his appearance. Blue pants or jeans, a possible hoodie or hat, a jacket, and a backpack, with his height being the only somewhat discernible trait. Despite this, the details were too limited to draw any definitive conclusions, prompting investigators to broaden their search for more substantial evidence. The footage capturing the enigmatic stranger was disseminated through various media outlets and presented to the public, with the hope that someone might identify him based on his attire or come forward to clarify his innocence as a mere bystander. The police's immediate objective was to ascertain his identity to eliminate him as a potential suspect. Despite this effort, the individual in question did not step forward, and although the police received multiple tips about his possible identity, none led to a conclusive breakthrough and inquiries into his involvement eventually reached an impasse. In parallel, investigators delved into the backgrounds of Brianna and Jason, engaging with their acquaintances and relatives to uncover any possible motives for their murder. They explored numerous angles, debts owed to drug dealers, disputes with other individuals experiencing homelessness over territory, or the possibility of being unintended casualties of a gang conflict. Despite extensive speculation, no concrete evidence emerged to support these theories. Ultimately, the investigation suggested that Jason and Brianna were not specifically targeted. It appeared they were merely victims of circumstance, tragically killed for being in the wrong place at the wrong time by someone with unknown motives. This chilling realization underscored the unpredictable danger lurking within the community. 
hinting at the possibility of a repeat offender capable of striking randomly. The subsequent incident less than a month after the tragic discovery of Jason Netter and Brianna Fuzzi only intensified these fears. On the morning of July 29, 2016, a 21-year-old man named Travion Kindle Thompson, affectionately called Trey by those close to him, became the latest victim of a seemingly similar violent act. Trey was known for his intelligence, kindness, and readiness to assist those in need, often going as far as bringing homeless individuals to his home for meals. On that fateful early morning, he was en route to his aunt's residence in East Anchorage on his bicycle, intending to feed her dog in her absence. Tragically, he was nearly at his destination when he was fatally shot by an unidentified assailant. Responding officers discovered Trey's body on the street, with gunshot wounds to his head and torso, and notably, like the previous case, no shell casings were found at the scene. However, in a potentially pivotal development, police identified a surveillance camera with a direct view of the location where Trey met his untimely demise. This devastating sequence of events, captured around 3 a.m. by a surveillance camera, unfolded with chilling precision. A man was recorded walking with eerie calmness down the street before abruptly raising his hand, drawing a pistol, and firing directly at Travion Kindle Thompson. Fatefully, this camera, located on Trey's aunt's property, where he was headed to perform a simple act of kindness, captured the grim scene mere meters from her doorstep. Remarkably, just weeks prior, Trey had fixed this very surveillance system that would tragically document his own fatal encounter. After Trey collapsed, the footage showed the assailant casually approaching, stowing the pistol in his pocket, commandeering Trey's bicycle, and then riding off into the night. Yet, the surveillance video wasn't the sole piece of evidence gathered. The incident had eyewitnesses. Two teenage girls who were up late, engrossed in sharing frightening tales by the window of a nearby home. They first became unnerved upon noticing a tall figure loitering by a fire hydrant, seemingly out of place in the dead of night. Their attention then shifted to another figure further down the street, Trey, just before the fatal shots rang out. After momentarily averting their gaze, they looked back to witness the tragic aftermath. Trey, lying motionless on the ground, and the assailant making a slow escape on the bicycle past their vantage point. These observant teenagers provided detectives with a detailed description of the shooter. An older man with shoulder-length wavy hair, wearing heavy boots, a cap, and a camouflage jacket, noted especially for his tall stature. The meticulous analysis of the surveillance footage allowed experts to approximate the shooter's height as around 6.2, or possibly even taller. With the detailed account from the teenage witnesses, a composite sketch of the suspect was crafted and subsequently disseminated to the public, alongside a photograph of Thompson's stolen bicycle. The police urged the community to remain alert and vigilant. The connection between Trey's murder and the earlier killings on the Ship Creek Trail was quickly made by investigators, further deepening the mystery as Trey, like Brianna and Jason, had no apparent enemies or known reasons to be targeted, suggesting the chilling possibility of random acts of violence. A forensic investigation conclusively linked the murders through the use of the same weapon, confirming the presence of a serial offender within Anchorage. As the case unfolded, the public's response to the composite sketch generated a flood of tips and leads. Among those contributing to the investigation was Trey's mother, Mendy Premo, driven by a profound sense of loss and a determination to find her son's killer. Refusing to remain passive, Mendy actively engaged with the community sharing the sketch and seeking information that might lead to the assailant. Her efforts led her to a pivotal observation. She spotted an individual on a bicycle identical to the one taken from Trey on the night of his murder. The man was seen heading towards a known homeless encampment, a secluded area where individuals without stable housing constructed temporary shelters. Recognizing the potential significance of her discovery, Mendy wasted no time in notifying the authorities hoping her proactive measures might finally bring about a breakthrough in the harrowing investigation. Patrol units were sent to the encampment where they indeed located the bike and confiscated it for further analysis. Yet, that wasn't everything. Close to the tree where the bike was positioned, inside a cavity, they unearthed a firearm. After conversing with the inhabitants of the encampment, the officers swiftly determined the ownership of both items. The individual possessing the bike and the handgun was taken to the police department for interrogation. Nonetheless, as the detectives continued their conversation with the vagrant, 
increasing skepticism emerged regarding whether they had detained the correct individual. It was revealed that he was an ex-officer who had previously served in the New York Police Department. Police forces receive specialized training in which they are instructed to fire using both hands, while the suspect caught on surveillance footage wielded the handgun single-handedly. Consequently, it appeared improbable that the man from the encampment was linked to the criminal acts. The handgun discovered within the tree cavity was also identified as being a different model, not the Colt Python 357 implicated in the three prior deadly occurrences. Upon detailed examination, the bike was also determined to bear only a slight resemblance to the one taken from Trey. As a result, the vagrant was excluded as a suspect, extinguishing the brief glimmer of hope. Exactly one month following the sorrowful demise of Trey, the Anchorage police were alerted to yet another pair of murders in the identical vicinity. In the dead of night on August 28, 2016, a woman traversing Moon Valley Park dialed 911 upon finding the cadaver of a young male, later recognized as 34-year-old Kevin Turner. Similar to Brianna and Jason, Kevin was without a home. Tragically, this young man was battling schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He had been in search of a facility focusing on mental health care, but failed to locate one that met his requirements. And now, his existence had been cut short. Kevin was discovered seated on a picnic bench in the park, his head laying on the table, clutching socks in his hands. His footwear was removed and positioned beside him, indicating he might have been assaulted while trying to wear his socks. It appears he didn't notice the assailant, as there was no sign he attempted to shelter from the gunfire. The authorities also found a second casualty in the park, later recognized as 25-year-old Bryant de Hassan, a local advocate for the environment. He was on a nocturnal bicycle excursion and was located not far from where Kevin Turner lay. Despite there being no direct link between the two, shell casings were missing from the scene, akin to the previous incidents. The projectiles that claimed the lives of Bryant and Kevin were discharged from the identical firearm, a six-shot Colt Python 357. Detectives promptly surmised that the same perpetrator was behind these assaults, elevating his total number of victims to five. Nonetheless, the police were still at a standstill in tracking down this individual. His identity remained a mystery. Following the third incident, the Anchorage police issued a warning to residents about the presence of a serial offender at large, urging them to exercise caution and avoid public parks and cycling paths, particularly during nighttime hours. The attacker was indiscriminate in his selection of victims, showing no particular preference or targeting a specific demographic, making the potential for anyone to be next. The community was engulfed in fear after this advisory. However, alongside the warning, the authorities announced a $10,000 incentive for information that could lead to the capture of the assailant. Despite receiving numerous tips and leads, progress in the investigation stalled. The situation took a dramatic turn in November 2016 when an entirely separate incident inadvertently guided investigators to a suspect. The way this breakthrough unfolded was astonishing. In the early hours of November 12, 2016, around 4.30 a.m., Anchorage Police Department's officer Arne Salau was patrolling downtown when he received a dispatch about a nearby crime. A taxi driver had reported a passenger who evaded fare payment and escaped from his cab. Close to the scene, Salau opted to search the vicinity for the fare evader. With the pre-dawn streets nearly deserted, he spotted a man walking on the sidewalk. Salau aimed to inquire if the man had noticed any unusual activity and called out from his vehicle, requesting the pedestrian to halt. The individual, however, disregarded Salau's command and continued on his path, an event captured by the patrol car's dash cam. Despite repeated orders, the man did not stop. Salau then escalated his efforts, using the car's loudspeaker to issue his command. Eventually, the man turned and walked towards Salau's vehicle but, rather than conversing, abruptly attacked, drawing a handgun from his clothing and firing at the officer. Salau exited his vehicle and engaged, returning fire. Sergeant Mark Patske, who was in the vicinity, intervened to assist his fellow officer, firing at the assailant. Officer Salau was struck four times sustaining significant injuries to his bones, liver, and intestines from the gunfire. Despite the critical wounds, Salau survived the ordeal. He was swiftly transported to a hospital where he underwent a critical seven-hour surgery. 
the perpetrator suffered a fatal gunshot wound to the skull and was pronounced dead on the spot. It was only after his demise that the detectives probing a spree of offenses in Anchorage in recent times were able to link this individual to the prime suspect. They examined the gunfight video from the dashboard camera of a police vehicle and cross-referenced it with footage from other cameras during prior events. This unknown man fit the profile of the serial offender. He donned a hat with a bill and a camouflaged coat, stood exceptionally tall, and fired using just one hand. Yet, there was an additional piece of evidence. The firearm wielded by the assailant was confirmed to be a six-round Colt Python 3 i 57 the same weapon connected to all five lethal incidents. The gunman was identified as James Dale Ritchie. So, who was this individual? James Dale Ritchie was born on November 4, 1976, in Anchorage, Alaska. Throughout high school, he was notable not just for his stature, but also for his exceptional intelligence. Ritchie excelled in athletics, participating in both football and basketball showing the capacity to pursue a professional sports career like two of his teammates. His talent caught the attention of West Virginia University's football team, leading to his recruitment following his 1994 graduation. However, Ritchie's life trajectory diverged significantly from what his peers anticipated. He enrolled at the university for one semester before withdrawing to follow an entirely different course. Upon returning to Anchorage, Ritchie's life began to decline. He developed an addiction to illicit drugs, engaged in theft, drug trafficking, and dogfighting. Ritchie faced multiple arrests, and in 2005, he was convicted for burglary and an attempted abduction with the use of zip ties and two handguns. After a two-year incarceration, James went back to Anchorage, where he is believed to have obtained his Colt Python revolver. In 2013, Ritchie relocated to his parents' home in the quaint Virginia town of Broadway. Even his mother expressed fear of him, describing him as a potential danger. She was convinced that her son's fate was either a lifetime in prison or a violent death. Despite these ominous predictions, Ritchie appeared to seek a change. He started to prepare for an associate's degree at a nearby college and attended classes. James was reportedly amiable to his neighbors, began relationships, and even experienced love. Nevertheless, Ritchie's later choices led him to a grim series of violent offenses culminating in his death during an encounter with law enforcement. Ritchie seemed to be realigning his life, yet this phase was short-lived. His romantic relationship concluded in a manner far removed from what he had hoped, causing deep distress for both individuals involved. Struggling to manage his feelings, Ritchie made his way back to Anchorage in March 2016. He even pursued mental health support and took antidepressants for a period. Law enforcement was unable to confirm if Ritchie had been formally diagnosed with any psychiatric condition, but indications suggest he might have genuinely struggled with schizophrenia. Following his passing, a former housemate disclosed that James Dale Ritchie frequently uttered bizarre claims, like possessing the power to alter weather conditions, sincerely believing he could summon rain or bring out the sun. He also harbored beliefs about his ability to dictate life and death, choosing who would survive and who would perish. Even posthumously, James Dale Ritchie was identified as the primary suspect in multiple shootings. Though detectives lacked concrete evidence to conclusively link him to the crimes, the similarities in physical description and the identical firearm used in all five cases provided a strong basis for suspicion. The challenge now lay in compiling additional proof to provide fresh assurances to the public. In the course of searching Ritchie's residence, Law enforcement officials found 18 shell casings concealed in his closet, precisely matching the count of rounds discharged from the revolver in all five incidents. Ballistic analysis confirmed that the firearm belonging to Ritchie was responsible for the fatalities of the victims. This proof was deemed sufficient to officially declare in April 2017 that James Dale, Ritchie was the assailant behind the serial offenses that had cast a shadow of terror over Anchorage for months. Regrettably, this revelation did little to comfort the victims' families, who would have preferred for the culprit to be apprehended, tried, and sentenced to life imprisonment. The rationale behind Ritchie's lethal actions against these five persons remains elusive and is probably destined to stay unresolved. An intriguing detail surfaced that may or may not bear relevance to the case. In his youth, James had been close to the father of Trey Thompson, Bobby Thompson. This long-standing friendship persisted, and at the time of his son Trey's murder, 
Bobby was incarcerated for offenses involving illicit drugs and firearms. This element prompts speculation on whether Richie was aware of his target that fateful night and if the memory of his friend crossed his mind. Evidently devoid of any remorse, Richie perpetuated his criminal spree. His apprehension was fortuitous, suggesting that if not for that incidental encounter, the tally of his victims could have exceeded five. If you like this story, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss new videos. Don't forget to like and share your opinion in the comments. This is Jeremy. See you in the next video.